in West Cruz, and uh, it's going to be a great race. Well, the field is set. Up front, the man on the pole is Butch Gilliland, who has won his first pole ever here at Mesa Moran. He's flanked by the 75 car Bill Sedgwick in row two. We have the 28 car Gary Collins from right here in Bakersfield, and the number 56 car from Lakeside Ron Esau. Another local driver goes off in the fifth starting position. That's Mike Chase. And then he's flanked by car number 73 from Running California, three-time national champion, Bill Schmidt. And, of course, we go back to that next row, the 04 car from Portland, Oregon. And that is the legend, Herschel McGriff, alongside the 91 car, who has been working all night to get this car back on the starting grid to take the green flag in this California 400, the 91, Robert Sprague out of North Bend, Oregon. From here in Bakersville, California, is car number 72, starting ninth, Mark Reed. Tenth from Chico, California, is car number nine, J.C. Danielson. Starting 11th is double zero, Scott Gaylord, all the way from Jacksonville Beach, Florida. Starting 12th is car number 99 from Roseville, California, John Krebs. From Palmdale, California, starting 13th is car number 86, Ron Hornaday, Jr. 14th from Boning Lake, Washington, car number 60, Larry Gunselman. 15th is car number 98, Billy Jack Shaw from Minden, Nevada. 16th on the grid from Orangeville, California is car 15, Rick Scribner. 17th from Sacramento, California is car number 44, Jack Sellers. 18th, car zero, Tim McCauley from Huntington Beach, California. Starting 19th is car 22, St. James Davis from West Covina, California. And starting 20th is car number 93, Wayne Jacks from Las Vegas, Nevada. That's our starting lineup here for the California 400 from Mesa Moran Raceway outside of Bakersfield. Back to Mesa. What's the West Guard? All the colors of the rainbow come to the strike. Who will lead the first lap? It'll be interesting to see. Sedgwick takes him high to the outside. Gilliland low to the inside. They run abreast of each other. Off the second quarter, Sedgwick tries to make a break. They shuffle and dice for position. Gilliland down low on the racetrack now as they come around to complete lap one. Sedgwick will be the leader to the line. Ron Esau has moved up. He's battling now for second place. Gilliland comes back strong down low on the inside of the racetrack. Sedgwick falls out in front again. They come back around. Both of these cars running heads up. They may make it three abreast. Coming back to the strike. First lap. 89.46 miles an hour, 20.12 on the six of the clock. They head back down the back straightaway, and what a race we have for first place. How long can Gilliland hang on in the low grid? Slips a little high now, brings the car now. Esau is going to close down on them. Esau makes the position for himself and actually hits the right front corner of the Gilliland car, trying to squeeze in behind Bill Sedgwick. Back in that fourth and fifth spot, we've got a battle going on. Gary Collins in the 28 car, and Mike Chase in the number 23. They are side by side to have been for the last couple of laps. Now into turn number one. Ron Esau looking for the opportunity to move by Bill Sedgwick. There's nothing more gratifying for a racing driver to be up front and see his number posted on the scoreboard as the leader. An exciting race here in the early going last lap. 88.45 miles per hour. That's a very fine speed for 3,500-pound race cars. And a new leader. You know, I'm, I, it's very curious looking at Sedgwick. Sedgwick seems to be unable to keep the 75 car down to the bottom side. So. Boy, it's a crash down in turn one. 75 goes sideways. Sedgwick is going to bring out the yellow as he collided with Gilliland and the zero car of Tim McCauley. The car sitting sideways down in turn one. The front bumper cap has been torn off of the car. Well, Sedgwick is coming off the racetrack under his own power, but the car is not steering. The front end of the car does not look good at this point, Bill. Apparently, he may have suffered some suspension damage. He did. He's broken a tie rod. And with a tie rod and a disarray, the front end will not steer. He'll actually be pushing one of the wheels as it goes into violent tow-out. And that's what's happening right now with the car 75 machine. Bill Sedgwick, always a strong runner. Looks like he's going to be sidelined early, or at least temporarily, put into the pits. His crew chief, Chris Robinson, is working on the car. And our very own 
Bruce Granders should be on the scene checking in to find out exactly what's going on. Let's go to Bruce now. Well, Bill Sedgwick's car has been behind the wall now for quite a while as they've been wrenching on it. The front end looks like it's about ready to go. When he does, he's going to have to do some kind of a U-turn right here in front of us and get us back. My guess is he's lost 10, 12 laps right now, and he's no longer in contention to win a race. In fact, as we just talked about it, I thought it was time for him to get back out, but they're going back to work on the front end, so Sedgwick's chances are going up in smoke. Now the replay. We pick it up a little after it happens. The zero car, Temple Cawley was down on the inside. Butch Gilliland was on the outside. They squeezed the 75 car between them. He took the damage on the front of the car as he spun sideways and picks it up against the wall. Mark just did a lazy spin, may have made contact with the inside guardrail. The yellow is back out. It will bunch the field back up once again. Well, the wreckers out to service the 96 car, which just spot on the back straightaway. Mark Moore from Lincoln, California. Apparently, he's okay, but some damage on the right side corner of the court. Thunderbird of Bill Schmidt. Well, a spin in turn three, and it's Ron Esau, John Kress, J.C. Danielson, and the yellow is out on the racetrack. Now, the drivers who want to get their lap back are racing hard. Gary Collins racing very hard, trying to beat Mike Chase back to the strike. Looks like he's going to be able to do it, but it doesn't look like Herschel is going to be able to do it. Herschel McGriff in the 0-4 car. But okay, let's take a look at what took place going into turn three. Once again, Ron Esau on the high side, J.C. Danielson on the inside. The squeeze was put on the nine car. And he put a right front fender into the corner of Esau, spun him around. Gilliland goes to the high side. Krebs cuts between the two, but narrowly connects with the left rear quarter panel. K400. Right now, the 23 bar of Mike Chase is your leader. Look out! Bill Schmidt goes sideways and around. He saves the car from the inside guardrail, and the yellow comes out. Now, Schmidt, if he can recover and come on around and get his stop and go, he will at least be only one lap down. Chase has got a whole lot of racetrack out in front of him. Again, an opportunity to kind of breathe the race car, settle down in the chair and get ready for uh, about uh, 30 laps of, of finish racing here. Almost a third of the race has been dominated by this local driver. Randy, perhaps you could fill us in on this driver's background, where he ran, how strong he got to be, because this is his home track. Well, Michael originally is from Northern California. He ran up in that uh, that uh, Shasta Speedway part of the country, kind of sharpened his craft there, and then uh, decided to go late model racing. The car actually came out of Redding, and uh, they would come down to Mesa Marin to run the open top stock car racing that uh, was prevalent in this part of the country. They're looking very hard at going back to the East to run the Winston Cup Series next year. Well, I imagine if they can dominate the race here, they could join some of the Winston Cup competitors who came out of this area, like Derek Cope and Chad Little. Those drivers, of course, started on the West Coast. And Ernie Irvin, the man that won the Daytona 500 this year, came out of the Southwest Tour. So the West is, uh, can be quite proud. Many of their drivers certainly have been competitive. Bob Walker has been having that good run in the 88 car, but we're showing Mike Chase as the leader. 88, Bob Walker, one lap down in second place. He has really been getting around this racetrack like no one else and has basically been doing it like the Phantom the Black Phantom in car 88. Walker has run a fairly conservative race. He's been on the money as far as turning consistent lap times. He's kept his car out of trouble and has basically realized, hey, this is 400 laps of competition. This is tough on any driver and his machine, especially on a half-mile facility like this one on a very hot Sunday afternoon. $73,000 plus the total purse for this 400 lap race. $13,200 plus going to the winner in Mike Chase. Probably is ready to ride to the bank on Monday morning. I want to thank the folks from the First of Line Electronics and Racing Radios for providing us our in-car radios this afternoon. They sure do a good job, and they are the first choice for in-car radios for communications between crew chief 
and drivers. A lot of times, that's the technology that will win races for you. But we certainly have had the opportunity to communicate with many of the drivers this afternoon via racing radio. Winding down this 400-lap chase under a beautiful California sun. I can tell you right now, Bill, that Mike Chase, the 23 car, is listening for every noise that you can imagine in that Brian Miller Buick. A vibration, a noise, something. He knows at this point that he has got to keep the car together, and every suspicious noise he hears is going to make that old heartbeat just a little bit more. He's got a great lead on the second-place car, but right now he wants to maintain that. We will have one lap to go. He'll get the white flag next time by. It's time to take it easy. You're almost home. You have enough of a cushion that you could probably coast around here and win the race. He goes high on the racetrack in turn four. He's coming to the white flag now. He's beneath the white flag of our flagman. Alan Porter, he's down into turn one, runs a high wide line off the second corner. Next time by, he'll get the checkered flag, an up-close shot of the fly miller, number 23, Buick. He's coming out of turn four now. Alan Porter waves the checkered flag, and the winner with his hand out of the window and claiming victory, $13,000-plus in prize money, is a hometowner, and they're going to be celebrating here.